Hey, this is Colin Nathan Alim, the real estate boy. And on the social media for real estate agent podcast today, we have our special guest, Chauncey Pham from the Dallas Fort Worth, Texas area. How you doing, Chauncey? I'm doing pretty good, man. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Now, why do we have Chauncey on the podcast? Well, for starters, she was ranked number 17 on Property Sparks list of the top YouTubers in the nation. On YouTube, she has over 17,000 subscribers. Instagram, she has over 8,000 followers. On Facebook, her average post gets 261 likes. Now, Fam is not only a realtor, but she's a national team leader at EXP, and she's also a flipper and vlogger. Man, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, we want to jump into it really fast as far as we can talk about all aspects of your life, but what were you doing before real estate? Uh, good question. So I started out in hardcore sales. So straight out of college, I quit college. I dropped out. I was like, I'm tired of being broke. <laughs> I was making more money in college selling door to door than I than, than any of my friends that had graduated. So dropped out of college, pretty quickly got into sales and I was in the merchant services industry. So that's credit card processing. Anybody knows anything about that world? It's very dog eat dog, very boiler room type situation. I was a sales manager, ran 1099 outside sales reps for a couple of years. I'm talking under the desk, on the phone, closing deals. The only girl out of like 50 men, a very like high pressure boiler room type situation. And then I moved on from that into marketing. I landed a gig some kind of way as an account executive with a marketing firm. And I learned so much about consumer behaviors and the marketing side of the business, because I worked as pretty much the liaison between our clients and in my company who actually curated all of their marketing collateral. And so that's what I did be before I got into real estate. And then it was a pretty easy and organic transition into real estate because I did have such a high level sales background and marketing. And those two things are, of course, um, essential to, to succeed in real estate. Now, did you know somebody that was in real estate prior when you was in that, that sales role? No, I didn't. I did not know any realtors. I knew nothing about real estate at all. Funny story, how I got into real estate, my husband and I inadvertently became flippers of our primary residences. So in lieu of having a wedding back in 2011, we were like, you know what, let's just save up the money that we've saved up. Let's just take that and build a house or buy a house. So we did that. Um, I got pregnant shortly after, and we were like, this house isn't going to work for a kid. Let's sell this and buy another one. And then we did it again with that second house. And so through those transactions, I was working with realtors, and they sucked. Like, they were literally <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and I had to take the transaction and carry it over across the closing table. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm seriously, as the homeowner, I'm calling the other agents, the lender for the buyer of our house, because we were doing a buy and sell at the same time. I was coordinating lenders, coordinating title companies. And so I said, you know what, if I'm already doing all of this, I should just get my license. And so ultimately I got my license for one reason and one reason only. And that was so we could go ball out at Disney World and uh, buy VIP tickets. And I was, <laughs> I was like, let's let's get my, my license so we can save money and not deal with sucky realtors. And so that we can go and have lots of fun at Disney World once a year. And that was in 2016. But I did not know anyone in the business before I actually got in. So was it your plan just to sell one or two houses and then use that money to go to Disneyland? Yep. yep. Okay. I, I literally was like, you know what? I'll sell a house to you know friends or family. My goal was to make $15,000 a year in real estate. And as long as okay. I can make 15 grand, I was good because I liked my job. I really enjoyed what I was doing in the marketing world. I got to sit in on food service photography shoots and I you know got to reset stores and understand how to set up stores to you know, kind of manipulate consumer behaviors. Like all of that was very intriguing to me. And I loved it. I worked from home. So I had no intentions of quitting my job, but then I got licensed. And because of that sales and marketing background, everything was very natural for me. And within the first three months, I had eight closings, which pretty much paid me my little $55,000 a year salary. I made that in a couple of months. And I was like, right. I think I should quit my job. And <laughs> here we are. Now, what year was that? That was 2016. I got licensed in August of 2016, and okay. uh, I quit my job in November of 2016 because I had seven houses under contract. Nice, nice. Okay, so that's after the Great Recession and mm -hmm. um, things were picking up. I got mine around 2017, and I actually did the same thing. I was interested because my 
I had bought a house, me and my wife bought a house. And it wasn't that my realtor sucked. I just didn't feel like he was proactive. Right. And it was just like, okay, if he can do this, I can probably do the same thing. Mm-hmm. No, mine's, not. mine's not in the business anymore. Oh, wow. no. So the question of beg, how did you get that realtor? Actually, a neighborhood group. So our neighborhood at the time had a Facebook group and I posted a question in there, you know, about realtors and he happened to send me a DM on Facebook and wow. a lots of other people had posted on the post and I almost got overwhelmed with all of the comments, but he specifically sent me a DM on Facebook. And because he did that, I was like, all right, cool. And, and I ended up hiring him and that was a huge mistake, but social media got him that business. Right. And that's one of my secret sauces is that, and I'll let it out here, is that when somebody does post something like, hey, I'm looking for a realtor or anything to that extent, I'll go to great lengths, the number one DM them and then try to find their phone number so I can call them. Because most people or most realtors are just going to stop at commenting on the page. So they'll just comment, hey, I can be your realtor, but they'll just stop there versus trying to go the extra mile and actually talk to the person. Yeah. I used to take it even further and I sent them video messages. Mm, Um, So I would send them a video in their DM. I would go and stalk and find their phone number and send them a video in their phone. And I always validated their feelings first by saying, hey, I understand that you're being inundated with tons of realtors that are reaching out. Like this would be creepy if I were you as well. But I just wanted to stand out and make sure that you got my message, which is, you know, X, Y and Z. And like clockwork, it works every time. Awesome. Okay. So you're in sales mm-hmm. and um, you're a powerhouse as far as in the sales world. Mm-hmm. And you're looking to make some, some side money. Yeah. So you become a realtor and you do eight deals. Did those just come from family and friends? Um, no, I did not do any deals with family and friends until I've been in the business for two years. Okay. Um, those came mostly from online leads and from my my social media family. So from posting on social media and being consistent with social media um, and being very, I guess, creative with open houses and leveraging social media for those got me all of those deals. Okay. Now before, what was your interaction with social media before becoming a realtor? Did you use social media in your, I don't want to say other job, but your formal job, did you use social media in a business way? I did not use it in a business way, but I did use it in a personal way. And I always knew how to captivate an audience from, I went through like a a weight loss journey. So after I had my daughter, I wanted to document, you know, my healthy food. So, so my Instagram was called fit fantastic and yeah, fit fantastic. And I was, you know, vlogging and, and pretty much showing my workouts and the food that I was cooking and eating. And I actually gotten a little bit of a following. And so I just, it it was something very natural about social media for me. And I think that's why people struggle with it is Mm. they, they try to manufacture content. And the whole thing about social media is guys, it's called social media, not Mm. selling media. Stop trying to sell on social media. Nobody cares about what you're selling. They're more interested in you as a person who you are. And if you can leverage that tool, because that's all social media is. Cool. Right. If you put a strategy behind it, which is to um, essentially make as many friends virtually as possible, then people will use you because they will feel like they know, like, and trust you before they ever even reach out to you. So no, I wasn't using it in my job, but I was using it personally to just kind of document the journey. And I said, well, hey, if it worked to get people to like look at my recipes and watch me working out, then surely I can apply kind of these same concepts and implement some things for my actual business. No. My question, I guess, when you're saying that is when somebody makes, because you were in essence making a vlog of your journey Mm -hmm. and weight loss. Mm -hmm. So did you start out with, okay, I'm looking to monetize this, or I just want people to kind of see what I'm going through to, I guess, motivate other people? What was your intentions in in making that vlog? My intention was to connect with people. That was it. You cannot go into any of this with money on your mind. If you go into it with money on your mind, instead of actually loving the process and trying to connect with people, the first time you hit a roadblock, you're going to stop, which is why I'm never concerned. People ask me all the time, like all these people are popping up with like YouTube channels and blah, blah, blah. 
I'm not worried about that because they're doing it because they see those of us that have done it and have been successful with it. And they're chasing our outcome. I post on YouTube because I love the process. I love curating the content. I love making the videos. I love sending it over for editing. I love seeing the final product. I love making the thumbnails, having the thumbnails made. I love tagging and posting all of it. I love that process. And if you hate that process, you'll never be my competition. Okay. Wow. And so when I, I got on social media and started posting, it was for one reason and one reason only. And that was to connect with as many people as possible in a short amount of time as possible. And the way that you connect with people is by being authentic and being real and showing your wins and your losses. It had nothing to do with money. But over time, of course, all of these things grew because I was so relatable and it turned into something that was monetized. But that was absolutely not on my radar anywhere at all when I first got started. Now, when people a lot of times what happens is that people will use social media leisurely. Mm -hmm. And then when they're using it leisurely, they think that the same tools apply when they're using it business wise. And the reason I'm saying that is because when you're using it business wise, like you said, there's there's different tags that you need to do because you can have the best videos in the world. But if it's not correctly positioned in a YouTube, the YouTube algorithm is not going to find it. Right. So I guess how did you make that transition? Because you were using it using it casually. But then you started to use it business wise. Are you saying that you kind of did the same things or when you're using it business wise, are you using uh, TubeBuddy or um, VidIQ or things I mean, I like have that? Okay. I have to, but so so we're, we're talking about different platforms, right? So okay. so what I was speaking about before with Fit Fantastic, that was Instagram. Um, okay. YouTube is a totally different beast in the way that I decided to use YouTube. Honestly, y'all, it was just common sense. I didn't do a ton of research. I did a little bit so that I could understand what I was getting into. But the biggest thing that I learned when I got into it was that number one, television ratings were falling at like an astronomical rate at the time. And YouTube ratings and and, and views were going up by like 350% per year and television was going down by like the same rate. So I'm like, look, YouTube is YouTube is replacing television. Thanks. Number one. Number two, YouTube is a search engine. So that tells me two things that I need to be, which is entertaining. And then I need to create my videos and name them in such a way that when people are going on, they're searching for things that they find. Mm. Okay? So I need to be an answer to a question and I need to be entertaining while I'm answering that question. And that those were the only two principles that I followed. Mm-hmm. I also went and found other YouTubers kind of in my realm that I, I enjoyed watching and kind of model, because I mean, that's all we do, right? R&D, we just rip off and rip off and duplicate. I went and found others that I liked, and then I would kind of follow their same video format. I would use the same tags that they were using, because hell, if they got 100,000 views on theirs, then I just use the same tag. But that was the extent of um, the technical side. Um, I have over 17,000 subscribers, but I only have 51 videos. I don't have hundreds of videos. Wow. Um, and the reason why is I, I read in doing that limited research that I did that the most important thing on YouTube and how you can get your video suggested the fastest is by by having a long watch time, by having a high retention rate. And my retention mm-hmm. rate is almost 10 minutes on wow. every single last one of my videos. People wow. actually sit and watch them for almost 10 minutes, which means when you sit and watch my video, then YouTube's going to suggest another one and it's going right. to suggest another one right. and then it's gonna suggest another one. And you're just stuck in my loop and in my tunnel, which is how I've amassed, you know, which 17,000 is not a crazy amount of subscribers for the amount of videos that I have, though, it is. And so for me, that that was what I did is I think people overthink it, especially mm. in real estate, because we're so accustomed to like building out these systems, having all of this consistency. And doing the same thing over and over. Y'all, YouTube is about entertaining. If you're boring as hell, I don't care how <laughs> consistent you are. No one is going to watch your video for 10 minutes. And right. YouTube is not going to suggest your video to someone else. And no one's going to get caught in your tunnel. I don't care what you say. And so, you know, for me, that was a really big part of, of what I did. So I just tried to be entertaining and answer people's questions so that when they type them in, I was the result that popped up. Wow. That engagement rate is, is like off the chain. now. I got to ask that type of engagement. Are you, do you have a script? Are you just having some bullet points and just talking bullet points? Are you talking to other people? I guess what's your, what's your, your formula as far as doing a video? 
I normally will write out on a piece of paper just so that I'm not rambling on, okay. on the video just to have some bullet points. And then I just take those bullet points and I, I speak and I just speak on them. And guys, keeping it simple, stupid is the easiest way. Uh, learn how to frame yourself, learn how to have good lighting, have, you know, some decent equipment. You don't have to have anything crazy. I just have point and shoot cameras, but they, they have good quality. They do autofocus. So my background is always blurred. You know, me in the foreground, I'm always really crisp, create some contrast. And, and I have, you know, a decent microphone. I think all of my equipment maybe costs $800, you know, like it's, it's nothing crazy. And I sit myself up funny here. I'll show you. I sit myself up in front of this big patio window because um, I just have good natural lighting and stack some books up on like a filing cabinet. Like it's nothing intricate, but that's kind of my formula is I just jot down, okay, what's going to be the topic? I jot down the bullet points that I'm going to have. I post up in front of that window and I just talk and I cut, you know, in between each one or I stop talking so that my editor can take it and he can kind of cut it up into those places. And that's it. Okay, so I'm going to recap as far as what you just said, because you said a lot there. and I don't want people to get lost. So you have the natural lighting, but you have lights there, too, or just the natural lighting? That That's it. I just do natural lighting with my vlogs. Okay. I like natural okay. lighting. And I've always heard that that's the best lighting. It is. Well, and that's how I started. Before okay. I really had a lot of money to invest into equipment and all of that, I was like, let me just find me a good window. So like, I always had to shoot like at the, the right time of day and have the right light uh, because okay. all I had was my window. But guys, it's free. Like you got a window. Okay. Just sit right. in front of it. So yeah, so find good natural lighting. Watch a freaking YouTube video on how to frame your yourself out and you know how to zoom in at the right amount and have the right amount of your face and body in, in the frame. And then just write out your bullet points on, you know, what your video is going to be about, what you're going to cover, and then just stop, look at it. All right. This is what I'm going to talk about. Put it down and go talk to the camera. And it was as simple as that. And then I sent it off to an editor. I found a really, really good editor. I've been working with him for years and um, sent it off to him and he makes it pretty and sends it back and that's it. Okay. And you have a microphone, an external microphone we can see in the right hand corner right there. But and this and is then you have a podcast again on vlogs. I don't do it on YouTube. I use a Sony ZV one. Um, it has a built in microphone. I do okay. have an external road microphone. I don't know. It cost okay. me like 50, 60 bucks that has a little muff on it. So when I'm outside, it, it, you know, takes care of the wind for me. Right. But other right. than that, like, that's it. Like I don't, I don't use any lighting or anything. Now I use lighting when I'm doing things like this because mm -hmm. um, I have to. So I do have to, kind of like studio lights in front of me. And then I have this, this microphone, but that's only for podcasts. When I'm shooting vlogs, I just use my window, man. Okay. And as far as the camera that you have, you're not using a phone. You're actually using a, a separate yes. camera, correct? Yes. I use a Sony ZV-1 or a Canon G7X Mark II. Right. I usually hear, I hear of the Canon. Both of those are two popular vlog. Yeah. They're type. just vlogging cameras. Yeah. They just allow you to, it has a little screen so you can see yourself. It does auto adjust. So the background is automatically kind of blurred, creates that depth and you don't have to change settings. And I don't know, they cost anywhere between five and $700. Right. And like you said, you have you write the points out as far as what you want to talk about. You talk about it, stop, look down at your points and then go back and then say it again. Correct. OK. Awesome. And all awesome. of my videos are one take. All of them. Are OK. <laughs> all of them are one take. OK. So what happens with a lot of realtors and this happened to me also in the beginning is that, of course, you want to be perfect per se. So you keep going and you mess up and you go back. You keep going, you mess up and you go back. I guess what prevented you from doing that or were you like that in the beginning and you just, okay, nix that. Let me just keep doing this one take. I mean, for me, being my authentic self was more important than being perfect to people. Okay. Like I, I got into this business because, you know, once I left corporate America, I was like, I'm going to build this business the way that I want it to be. And the only way mm -hmm. I can do that is to actually be me. Like I have to lead with me. And I just, I'm not for pomp and circumstance. And so I just, I didn't want to present myself in any way that wasn't true. And so if I slip and say a bad word, oh, that's just going to be in the vlog. <laughs> okay. And my doorbell rings and my, my dog starts barking. That's just going to be in the vlog. <laughs> like that's real life. And that's what people enjoy about it. So for me, it was more about being just true to myself. And then that's what actually like, captivated people and got them engaged. And that's, if you read the comments of my videos, that's what they say they love. Like, oh my God, I love you. Like, you're not perfect. Like, right. I just love how like real you are. And when people understand that power 
is in vulnerability. Mm. All of your power is in vulnerability. Everything changes for you. And so, yeah, no, one take. That's it. That's what you get. Yeah, that's tough, man. I mean, because I'm going to say this, but as a man, it's hard to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So because you don't want to give that presentation to the world. But everybody's vulnerable. So then if you're vulnerable, then that just makes you more relatable. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And And no no one else wants to be vulnerable. No one else wants to be vulnerable. So guess what that makes you when you are? Different. It makes you different. 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 Wow. That's definitely game changing as far as the setup. Now, are all of your vlogs based on real estate? Do you do things outside of real estate also? No, it's all it's all pretty well based around some sort of real estate. Some is retail. Some is, you know, talking to agents and explaining things to them. And then some is going to be the flipping side of the business. But it's all it's all retail related. Okay. Or, and do you have any sort of official process as far as getting content? Yeah. So. The official process is I look and see all of the dumb questions that people ask online. And every time I see one, (laughs) I jot it down in the notes section of my phone. And then when it's time for me to shoot, I go through my phone and say, that's a good one. That's literally what I do. So again, understanding who your target audience is, understanding the questions that they ask, Mm -hmm. and then answering those questions is the way that you, you really amass an audience. And so that's all I do. So I'll go into because my my audience is agents, right? Because I I am looking to to grow my revenue share group and, and grow mm-hmm. at my team at EXP. And so I want to attract agents. And so I'm looking to see the questions that they're having, the difficulties that they're having, the frustrations that they're having. What are they up in the middle of the night looking up because they can't sleep because they don't know where their next deal is going to come from? And I want to be the answer to those questions. I want to be the solution. So I just go where they are. Where are they? They're in private. They're in Facebook groups. They're, you know, online. They're they're everywhere. So anytime I see questions that are interesting, then I'll read the, the question, the, the main post. I'll go through the comments, see some responses and maybe come up with some subjects from that. And I literally have, I don't know, hundreds of topics in my phone right now that I could crank out videos. Gotcha. Now, a lot of what you what you spoke about was the reach as far as exposure, mm-hmm. getting people's attention. What are you doing as far as conversion? What type of call to actions are, are, are you putting call to actions in your videos as far as to get them to contact you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, so this is a strategy that most people are not willing to do, which again is the reason why I have amassed the amount of people in my team in the short amount of time that I have. Most realtors and most people that are in a profession get so pissed off When somebody says, let me take you to lunch, buy you a cheeseburger and a beer and pick your brain, right? Like how many professionals have you heard that? They think they can trade in all of my knowledge and all these tears and years and money I've spent learning what I know for a cheeseburger, right? I get mad about that. And I said, what if I actually let them reach out to me? What if I actually promoted, come and pick my brain for free? I will have a conversation with you for free. And because I have all of these digital products over here, and because I'm a coach and I have a coaching program, you know, I'm I'm a coach with Hero Nation, because I have this revenue share group that people can join, I have all of these things that I can sell to them. Why don't I let them pick my brain? Why don't I add some value to them at the beginning of the call? And then why don't I use that as an opportunity to turn it into a sales call? And that's what I did. So uh, for the last year, I scaled it and I made a system out of it. But for the first year that I started doing it, I was taking eight to 10 individual free pick Chauncey's brain session calls every single day, every single day. And I was either converting them to agents on my team. They were buying digital products from me or they were becoming coaching clients. One of the three, by the end of the call, they did one of the three. So I was monetizing those free calls, those pick Chauncey's brains. And the ones that didn't do one of those three, then they sent me referrals. Either way, I was winning, right? And then what I did is I said, okay, this is this isn't sustainable anymore. But what I can do is I can scale this. So now I'm gonna pull back and I'm gonna do two weekly group calls. And now I get about 20 to 25 people on every single Tuesday, Thursday group call that I have where people come on and pick my brain in a group setting. And it's pretty cool, you know, how we get on, we we talk, we collaborate, almost have like little mastermind calls. And so now I'm getting agents kind of in mass doing all of these different things and and using all of the different offerings that I have. So yeah, so that's my call to action. My call to action is, you know what? You found my channel because you're searching for something. Mm 
-hmm. and you obviously stuck around because you like my content in some capacity, book a call with me for free. Click the button and I'll talk to you and I'll answer whatever question you have. But then you're going to listen to me. (laughs) (laughs) And you're going to pick one of these things. Right. Now, with that story, how did you get to the there? How did you get there from, okay, I'm going to just sell homes just so we can go to Disney World? You went from there to a national team leader. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was some type of, I want to say education, or was it just like, like, how did you get from there from just selling homes on the side to being a national team leader? A conversation I had with my dad. My dad has always kind of been an entrepreneur. He just sits on the lake and goes fishing all the time. He's retired, you know, in his early 50s. And I was frustrated with, you know, clients and working the business and constantly having to be out doing the grind. And he said something to me one day that just stuck and it made me change my thinking, which was, baby, you're tired because you're digging for the gold. You need to just sell the shovels. Mm. And I was like, oh, (laughs) okay. Okay. And he was like, yeah, that's why you're tired. He was like, it's it's always going to be people out here digging for gold. They're they're always thinking they're going to strike rich and they're going to keep digging and keep digging. They're going to break their backs. And that's what they're going to do. But you can sit back and drink lemonade and sell them the shovels so they can go do their thing. So if you can figure out how to do that, you can still make the money, but you can rest and you can make the money on your time. And that's what made me stop and think about the fact that I was being my business instead of building it. Mm-hmm. And it made me reevaluate what my priorities were in my business. Okay. Now, did you change directions by getting... And I'm just going to throw this out there. Did you get a coach? Um, You didn't? Okay. I didn't get a coach. I didn't do any of that. I went from being an agent to then finding out and figuring out after I had that conversation with my dad that I could open up my own brokerage in Texas without Mm -hmm. actually being a broker. Mm -hmm. It's something called a business entity broker's license. So I got that for my business entity and opened up my own brokerage. Then I started bringing agents into my brokerage. And then from there, it just kind of went, you know, step by step. So then I had the brokerage and then I moved my brokerage over to EXP. And then from that, now I have, you know, 300 and some odd agents, you know, across 32 different states. And then, you know, I went into more of the coaching side of things because I I always wanted, again, to be able to build something that ultimately I could step out. Okay. Now speak about your coaching program for a second. Are you teaching other agents to do the same thing as you as far as to sell the shovels or are you teaching them as far as the nuts and bolts as far as how to be an agent? I teach them whatever they need. I teach them whatever they need. I've always historically had a big problem with coaching because I feel like coaches can typically only teach what they know and they sometimes get tunnel vision and teach the same method. And everyone doesn't need the same method because everyone has different skill sets. Everyone has different weaknesses and strengths. And so what I focus on is um, I evaluate people's strengths and their weaknesses, and then I teach them how to use those strengths and leverage those strengths to make money in real estate. So if your strength is, I don't know, uh, events, then you love planning events, then we've got to figure out how we can help you plan more events to build your real estate business. If your strength is going to the gym, then we need to figure out how to leverage the gym to get you more real estate business, right? And so my coaching, and I actually don't even just coach realtors. Mm. One of my favorite clients that I had was a glass company, a a large glass company that's doing almost $10 million a year in sales in Alaska. A husband and wife hired me and their business just needed fixing. And, And I went in and helped them streamline their hiring process, build out duplicatable systems within. We put forth some some KPIs into their business. And so I just coach to whatever people need because I, I wholly believe that you've got to coach to the whole person in order okay. uh, for them to build a whole business. Now, where do you think you learned those skills at? Is that from your career before being a realtor? No, it's just natural for me. It's hard for me to explain. Yeah. Like I can literally just talk to somebody and look at look at their business and say, this is where your hole is. Like fix that, okay. plug up that hole. And I have holes in my business that I can't see. Okay. Right. So don't get me wrong here. I Tiger Woods have a coach. Right. But I can see it in yours and I can tell you right. step by step what you need to do to fix it. So that's just one of those skills that, you know, I, I've always sought out to solve problems. Mm. Always sought mm. out to solve problems. It's all I do because there's no right. problem. There's no sale, period. 
Right. And so I think because I'm always looking for problems and looking for ways to solve them, it makes it very easy for me to kind of map out what needs to be done in a business. Yeah, I do the same thing. It gets me in trouble with my wife a lot, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm like, listen, if you say something, you must want me to solve it. So let me go to solve it. We solve it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, do you think as far as social media go, is your favorite platform YouTube? Do. I like I like YouTube and I like Instagram. I like them, I think, equally for different reasons. See, I think Instagram is my weakest platform. Love it. Now, have you ventured into TikTok? I mean, with TikTok and Instagram. I have. Being... And TikTok does not like me. Okay. TikTok does not like me. I've tried <laughs> and I cannot get more than like 300 views. And, and I know that if I'm consistent, then I then I will. I just right. know, I just don't know that right now that I'm willing to put in that work to build out another platform. Okay. So, I mean, that's just the reality of it. I, I haven't really given it a fair shot and given it the consistency that it would need. Yeah, see, TikTok is my best platform. Oh, awesome. Um, so, but Instagram, I don't seem to get a lot of love on Instagram for some it's reason. So it's much like, business. And, and something that I would tell your audience right now is, guys, stop chasing followers. Mm. Stop chasing subscribers. I was getting, on average, probably three three to four deals a month from YouTube before I even had a thousand subscribers because people would just find me and they didn't necessarily subscribe because when I first started my YouTube channel, I was talking to the consumer. I was explaining to them the home buying process, selling their homes. I was talking more to them, you know, answering their questions. So again, I was thinking like, what is somebody up searching right now? Um, and I would answer those questions. What is title insurance? How do these loans work? Why Why should I not or should I sign a buyer representation agreement? How does that work? So I was answering all of those questions and I was legitimately getting three to four buyers a month. They weren't subscribing to my channel because I mean, like who subscribes to a realtor like when you're just looking to buy a house right now? Right. But they liked me. And because my information was readily available, they would reach out to me. So guys, Focus more on your call to action and focus more on, on solving the problems than you, you do chasing the subscribers. The subscribers and the followers will come. Now, are these people, were these people in the Texas area? Because I know Texas is a no. big uh, relocation area. A lot yep. of people come in and move in. They were so relocating these- here. I got okay. so many from other states, like so, so many from other states. I sold quite a few at the beginning of the pandemic that just like reached out like, hey, I can't come. We can't really get on a plane. I'm in California, but this is you know, what I'm looking for. I've found your videos. I love you. Love your personality. Feel like I already know you. Can you help? California to Texas, man. That seems to be the pipeline. Yep. California, Colorado. Did a lot of California, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada to Texas. Okay. To Texas. Okay. What about people who are who are not in relocation areas? I guess what advice would you give to them as far as they get buyers on a YouTube? Answer their questions. Solve Answer their problems. Them. Yeah. Like what are buyer problems right now? It's tons of them, right? Like how do I win offers uh, in multiple, uh, how do I win bids in multiple offer situations? How can my offers be more competitive? How can I find builders that won't change the price midstream, you know, mid construction? (laughs) How can I, like all of the problems that they have, you need to be making videos about what new construction upgrades are a money grab versus those that actually add value to my house. You know, top five ways that builders are taking advantage of unrepresented buyers, like all of these things, like how can I buy a house and not be upside down in this market? Mm -hmm. Answer the damn questions. Like it's, it's that simple. That's it. Gotcha. On, um, now, as far as Facebook, are you are you utilizing that also? A little bit. I okay. post on Facebook. I only really post um, on my personal page on Facebook. My Instagram is linked to my business Facebook. So every time I post on Instagram, it automatically goes to right. my business Facebook. But really, Facebook is more um, on the personal side. I do mostly post, you know, content that has undertones of real estate and marketing things. But um, I just I have more fun with Facebook. Okay. As far as posting, is there anything else professionally that you do that you outsource other than the editing? Do you have a type of some type of vlogger that follows you around or? okay? Nope. Nothing. Nothing yet. Eventually, I can see myself probably getting there. But Mm -hmm. as of right now, nope. Just do it on myself and just send it off to the editor. Okay, And like you (laughs) said before, I guess the bottom line is kind of to entertain, to be entertaining first and then follow that with the education. Correct. Okay. So if there's a new realtor who's watching this 
what's your advice to them as far as, okay, a realtor just got my license. What should I be doing day number one? Documenting. Document, document, document. Stop making real estate and social media in real estate a chore. Okay. First of all, tweak your brain. Stop thinking about social media as a task that you've got to do and think about it as a task that you get to do. You get to share yourself and share your story with so many people that you could be impacting that you do not even realize. So you get to do it. So every time you're like, oh, I got to make another video, like, no, I get to make a video. I get to share what I'm doing today. So that's the first thing is change your mindset around the actual task of social media and then stop making it a task and just make it a part of what you're already doing. If you're going to the store, if you are having a conversation with a client, pull out your camera and document it. And before long, you will have so much footage because that's the thing, guys, your problem isn't that you don't have any footage to create or that you don't have anything interesting enough to create. You just don't know how to curate it and turn it into something that you know you think people want to see. And the whole gag is people just want to see you. So just start documenting. I would say that's the easiest way. Number two, I would say to get more comfortable with video, incorporate video into your leads. So in your communication style. That is something else that I did that I think gave me a leg up and got me very comfortable with video before I even started my vlog. I was communicating with my leads via video. So if I got a lead from somewhere or I had a conversation with someone, I would stop. I would pick up my phone. Hey, Sam, it was awesome talking to you today. Just want to follow up with our call, blah, blah, blah. Like I always, always, always communicated via video. So then when it came time for me to document, you know, sitting in my kid's game or whatever it was that I was doing, I was already very comfortable in front of the camera. So start communicating via video, start documenting what's going on in your day-to-day life and change your mindset around the tasks that you've got to do with posting on social media to, I get to do this instead of I've got to do this. Attitude. Attitude, what's your attitude? What are your top social media tools? What what type of tools are you using in your social media for any platform? Uh, tools like software, tools. hardware, like what? Like software, like some people use Hootsuite as far as a social media scheduler. There's some people that use different things for their descriptions. For, for example, YouTube, I struggle in writing the description. I know that's something that's important because the YouTube algorithm is looking to see, okay, what is this video about? And they're looking in the description. Are you writing all of your descriptions yourself? Okay. And what's the- I literally do everything myself. Like I don't, and it doesn't take up a lot of my time. Like I, and I'm not a rocket scientist and I'm not, I just speak from the heart. You know, mm-hmm. if I know I haven't posted for a while on Instagram, then I, I just, I post and, you know, I post a picture and then I share a story. Um, mm-hmm. something that may inspire someone or, or help someone, you know, about my life or like, guys, it's, it's very simple boils down to four things when posting. So I guess this could be some practical advice for, for the folks okay. beyond just documenting and changing their mindset and, and practicing with communication, the four ways that you want to communicate and four types of posts that you can make storytelling. So storytelling, you need to tell nightmares and you need to tell fairy tales. So any nightmare story that you can think of, someone not using a realtor, not using you as a realtor, even a nightmare story just about your life, just share it, right? And try to tie it back into real estate. And then the same thing with fairy tales. So any type of good, feel good type stories, like share that. So nightmares and fairy tales, then answering questions that your target client is Googling. So think about what they're Googling. And then you need to be posting content that's answering their questions. And then the last thing is posting content that is relieving their frustrations or solutions to their problems. That's it. If you stick to those posts, like you don't really have to think much. All right, cool, man. Well, that's, that would have answered my next question as far as what people could jump off of here and uh, do. So you guys who are looking for practical advice, he just gave you four easy steps or four easy content cues that you can take and um, put in your business. Before we go, do you want to mention the digital products that you currently have? Yeah, sure. If you guys just go to chaunceyfam.com or go to myrealestaterebel.com. Just click on chaunceyfam.com on like agent training and it'll take you over. Uh, we have lots of you know new agent type training. We have YouTube for agents, video for agents. 
And then if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area or want to travel to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I put on um, live in-person workshops to do things. So our latest in-person workshop is going to be on April 30th here in Dallas. And it's basically like a content house for realtors. So uh, rent it out a large mansion. Uh, we'll have lots of videographers, photographers, makeup artists. And then we're going to be teaching you how to actually curate content. So like, this is how you make a reel. This is how you make a TikTok. Here's a cool little editing hack. Here's a cool lighting hack. So that you walk away with tons and tons of content during this eight hour type event. So yeah, absolutely. Just go to chaunceyfam.com and you guys can catch up on on all of those products. Chaunceyfam.com. And we'll definitely see if we can get some type of discount using the the hashtag uh, social agents for you guys. So we'll talk about that offline. So um, all right, cool. Well, listen, agents. If you do have referrals in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area, you definitely know who to reach out to. And Chauncey, if you're ever in Philadelphia, just let me know. I'll get you a cheesesteak. I know they probably got fake cheesesteaks, Philly cheesesteaks down in Texas. (laughs) But (laughs) when you come up, we'll uh, definitely get something. So, all right, guys, this has been a pleasure.